people's charts. So uh, somebody asked me this on, um, on online, also on YouTube, I think. And I said, oh no, it was on Instagram. Um, so you kind of have to know what you're looking for. So what was coming up was I was getting a lot of that's not going to happen or a lot of blocks. I was seeing a lot of blocks of thing happening without really quite being able to identify what that block was. But think about it. Like if you've never seen an elephant, like you see some large animal, if you don't know what an elephant is, and if you don't even think about elephants, you know, um, if you keep seeing something in the way that you can later identify as an elephant, you're not going to know what it is. You're going to say, I just see something in the way. I just, right. seem like, I don't know why it's not going to happen. I don't know why that's not going to work out. I just, it just doesn't seem like it's going to work out. So that could lead to a number of frustrating readings also, because it's not like anything else was going to work out either. Yeah. And in terms of the stuff, like I had stuff planned in April too. I should pause the recording. Um, oh, hi. Hi, Heidi. Um, uh, Dana just asked me um, as a psychic, like, if I had seen, um, hi, Emily, hi, Sarah. Uh, if I had seen, you know, this pandemic coming and what I said, I was asked, somebody asked me this on Instagram. And um, so there's actually another part of the answer too, which is that at the beginning of the year, there was this astrological aspect, um, uh, uh, Pluto and Saturn conjunct each other. And that, traditionally plus the neptunian aspects one of the many things that it can mean is plagues so but this is an aspect that was in place that that was in aspect had some it was exact in january but it had effect for the year prior and has an effect for the year following too so you know exactly predicting it astrologically not so much but um what was coming up in readings was, um, hi Sheila, hi everyone. Uh, Dana asked me if I had seen the um, pandemic coming as a psychic. And what I said was what was coming up in readings with blocks. There was a lot of, like there were events or, or people, a lot, it was coming up a lot like, mm, you know, like that's not gonna work out. Like I, I, I just see blocks, I don't really know why. And it's not like most of the other questions about like what was gonna work out. Like, so it led to some frustration in terms of readings, but just seeing things like not happening or blocked. And I was saying to Sheila, like in a certain sense, what you see psychically, it, there's always an aspect of being able to interpret like the sort of symbolism, the imagery. Sometimes it's really obvious. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes you just see blocks, but you don't really know what it is. What I said to Dana was like, say, for example, you've never seen an elephant you see some large creature in the way, like trying to describe it. It's you're, you're, later you'd be able to identify it as an elephant, but you're just gonna be able to see, you know, I see this like large moving thing in front of you. I don't really know what it is, but I see a large moving thing in the way. And it was kind of like that. So, all right, hi. So let's start with an ohm and then we'll get going. Okay, I'm going to start with some of the questions that came in. We got questions from Tina and from, uh, from Sheila. And uh, so Sheila's first question was, what do you think about cards falling out and choosing cards? So I think if cards fall out while you're doing a reading, that's something to pay attention to. I always pay attention when cards fall out. Or if you're mixing the deck, if you're mixing the cards on the table and a card turns over, I pay attention to it. 
Um, and choosing cards, I think, you know, it's totally fine to, you can do a layout sometimes and sometimes you might just pick a card. I think both are, both are valid approaches. Um, and uh, then her next question was, in Mexican shamanism, we believe that there is a smaller mind at work within us and we as warrior travelers need to constantly be vigilant and keep our own mind, which is the universe perceiving itself. Um, and she asked, I, uh, I've been wondering how much of the classic deck is from the small mind. Uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, the, initially the Tarot is a, uh, is a, is a game. <laughs> so like that's definitely small mind. I think it really has to do with how you are approaching it. And if you get a really dark reading, like, that's really interesting to work with. And it's really interesting to work with what comes up around it. And the question, you know, becomes like, were you approaching it from like, uh, from a question it, uh, ask, asking from, from a small mind perspective in yourself? And this is not to be judgmental. It would be more about like, you're, you're having a conversation with either a part of yourself or a guide or something like that. So perhaps, that part of yourself is trying to tell you that from the place that you're asking this question, the responses are going to be dark. But you can put yourself, you have the option to put yourself in another place. The cards themselves are, um, like I said, it's a game. They were a game. They very quickly started being used as um, uh, for divination, almost from the beginning. But that's because like the images on them are classic images from um, Western iconography, Western spiritual iconography, which, you know, if you go into churches in Italy, you'll see these images, you know, you'll see justice and temperance and, you know, they, they're just, they're part of our culture, which is why we can respond to them as opposed to, we can respond easily and intuitively to them perhaps more so than it might be like a Chinese divination system like the I Ching or the Nordic runes or something like that. It's, this is something that's within our, um, it's, it's part of our cultural makeup, these images, you know, we easily understand them. Um, but the cards themselves can certainly reflect small mind or large mind. One would tend to say that the, Minor arcana are more toward the small mind and the major arcana are more towards the universal mind, but you know, it really depends where you're coming from more. Does that answer your question? Okay, you are muted just so that you know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, thank you. okay. <laughs> and Tina asked a lot of questions. Um, and let's see. Uh, she wanted to hear more specifics about organizing the cards before doing the readings. Um, and I myself personally organize them before I do many readings, certainly uh, readings for clients. Um, and then I mix them, I mix them a lot so that they get completely mixed and with completely mixed with the energy of this person. I didn't do this all the time. I haven't done this. I've been reading Tarot for if I tell you that ages me completely <laughs> but anyway, for many, many years. I've had decks since I was eight and I've been doing it professionally since um, my some point in my twenties. So, you know, we're talking over 30 years here <laughs> and there's a lot of different ways that I've done it. Um, so I find, I do find that organizing the cards via the suits, each of the suits and the, the and especially putting the major arcana in order again and again and again starts to give you a sense of how of the relationship between these cards how they flow after each other and part of what you want to do is become familiar with your deck you want your deck to start speaking to you because that's also very important in terms of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the court cards. And I think with the court cards, perhaps more than any other cards, these are the cards that represent aspects of yourself and of people in your life, important people in your life. And in thinking about like, well, what was I going to tell you about the court cards? Because 
I mean, there's, there's many, there's several different ways that these court cards get um, interpreted, um, depending upon small mind, big mind, depending upon any of a number of things, <laughs> depending upon like the traditional way is that they just represent a person that looks a certain way. The wand cards look a certain way, the, the cup cards look a certain way. And then, um, and then there's, I'll, I'll get into this more, but I feel like with the court cards and, and you know, with the major arcana too, like sometimes if you just look at them, you'll almost feel them speaking to you. You will almost, you'll almost know like whether this is somebody else you, that this, that this is, that they're talking about that's in your life or whether it's a part of you, both of which are sort of ultimately the same because you wouldn't see what you're seeing in this person if it wasn't something that existed within you to be able to recognize in them. Um, but it is telling you about some influence, but I think more than anything, you want to pay it, you, you want the court cards you, you want to have a, you want to have a personal re reaction, a personal response. You, you, you want to sort of feel what this person has a tendency to be saying to you, whether it's a part of yourself or whether it is part of, uh, whether it's someone else. Um, and when I read for myself, is there a specific way? Um, Oh, and Tina also asked, did you organize this way or that way? Organize them any way you want. Play with lots of different ways. I organize all of, I, I first divide them into piles according to suit and the minor, major arcana, and then I put them in order. The major arcana in order 0 to 21, and the minor arcana ace to 10, and then king, queen, prince, princess, or son, daughter. That, that's how I do it. Um, and when I read for myself, I tend to use uh, the Celtic cross, it's just, and sometimes I just pick cards. Um, when I read for myself, unless I am very careful to like really ground myself beforehand, I will tend not to get, you know, I'll tend to get the kind of reading Sheila was talking about. <laughs> it's like, like, it won't really tell me anything that I want to hear. It'll just be like, you know, I'll just reflect what's going on in my mind. I'm just gonna go, ha, 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 here. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, but if I do take the time, then the reading will be valuable. And if I feel, like I really pay attention to whether it feels right for me to do a reading for myself, because um, I think it's a really great way to learn the cards, to do readings for yourself. But I mean, I already know the cards, so um, it's, I, I think it's an excellent way to learn the cards, but, um, but at a certain point, uh, it's better to start reading for other people. And also at a certain point, it, you, you need to be aware of, um, of why you're asking and when you're asking and whether it's right to ask. Um, let's see. Uh, she says, so I was thinking about what the cards that leave uh, reversed in the deck. Won't the energy change every day, but is it just to trust to get the right cards? And, um, and how to trust every time and finding the right energy. So I think I already answered that. It's like, if, you're, if it's a deck that you're primarily reading for yourself, then you are, again, looking at how that energy is developing day to day. And yes, it's important to center yourself and get in the right place and mix the cards. You know, you'll be surprised. You can mix the card. The cards can really change without being put back into the same place. And it doesn't matter how you mix the cards. Um, I mix them the way I do, like on the floor or on the surface, to change the reverse so that it, they, they change whether they're reversed, so that some cards will reverse and some cards won't. Um, Okay, uh, it is important, the reverse cards. You don't have to pay attention to the reversals so much if you're first learning them. And, um, but the, it is important, it, at the very least, think of it as the energy as being either somehow blocked or in the process of changing. And uh, she had the, the 
Crowley's Thoth deck and then switch to the Rider Waite. And those are two very uh, seminal, important decks that I usually show when I'm showing pictures of different cards because they have both had a big influence on um, other decks since then. So those are two good decks to use. The Rider Waite is sort of like the grandfather or grandmother of pretty much all uh, tarot decks. So does anybody else have any other questions before I move on to the court cards? Yes, Sarah. So there we go. Hi. Uh, I was actually curious about the connection between Kabbalah and Tarot. Like, uh -huh. started and got infused in. And... I'm sorry, I can't hear you that well. Kabbalah and Tarot, what was the question? Just how they merged or how the influence came about. Okay, so around the turn of the century, let's see, when did, uh, when was Crowley and all, Crowley was like the turn of the century, uh, it was in the early part of this century, uh, Arthur Waite, 1888-ish, um, 18, 1888 um, so um, around the time that the tarot became associated with uh, spiritualism of a certain sort, late 1800s, early 1900s, people came up with all different kinds of ideas about where the tarot originated. And um, the Thoth deck, Thoth, Thoth deck, Crowley's deck, you know, that's like relating Thoth Egyptian, uh, although the cards don't look particularly Egyptian. But the idea being that the tarot is related to ancient, very old at least, Jewish, mis a Jewish mystical tradi tradition, and that in the time of the pharaohs, that the, the Jews were the um, primary teachers or priests of the pharaohs, and that, the whole, that they had this whole system that then uh, came down to us through the Kabbalah, um, and through the, the imagery on the tarot. There is really no proof of this, but I, you know, I learned it all when I was really like deep into the tarot in my uh, 20s and um, 30s. And I don't remember it, I don't remember it as, you know, as closely as I once knew it. Um, but uh, in many of the, certainly in Crowley's deck and in many of the kinds of interpretations, even with weight as well, they relate to the Kabbalistic system of the tree of life, which is a series of 10, they're called sephirot, 10 points. And um, those 10 relate to the um, age through 10 of each suit. And then the, yes, that's it exactly, right. The, um, the pathway, if the pathways between the sephirot relate to the major arcana. The major arcana are the pathways. And then the court cards, that tree of life is, um, exists on four levels for fire, water, air, and earth. And the court cards are representative, are the rulers of each level. But yeah, I can, right now I'm, I, I, you know, the, there's the, there's each element. Yeah, so, um, so there is, if you get really into the tarot, you will want to start reading about the tree of life, that aspect of the Kabbalah. So in the, at the time that I was really into it, I went to also take a course on, um, I never know if it's Kabbalah, Kabbalah or Kabbalah, Kabbalah. It, in, um, I was living in New York at the Jewish Cultural Center or something like that. And what you will learn if you do that, it's much like whether or not you take Sanskrit at an ashram or if you take Sanskrit at a university, you will not learn the sephirots and the tree of life and you know the relationship of the tarot, just FYI, should you want to do that. It's better to buy a book that has to do with the tarot. Um, you'll learn interesting things, but it won't be that. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I bought the Zohar, which is supposedly the, the book that from that, which has all of this, the, of the Jew, you know, the uh, transmitted mystical teachings um, 
that certainly don't mention the tarot. Um, so did that answer your question? But, but, but the meanings are the meanings of the different points on the tree of life and how it's kind of like also in Samkhya philosophy and yoga, there's a, there's a genesis, an evolution of matter from its pri primordial undifferentiated state to the world of things, that material reality that we experience. It is not the same evolution of matter um, in, with the tree of life, and the tree of life doesn't separate matter from, um, from self, from consciousness, uh, which, uh, which is what happens in Samkhya. But there is an evolution from that initiating top point of energy matter down to the to its manifestation in number 10 and each of those area each of those sephirot those points means has has a numerology a number and so there's a numerology associated with it which numerology is a big part of the sort of vibratory significance of the of hebrew with like gematria that's all about numbers um, so all of this comes into play in the meaning, especially with the major arcana, but also with all of the tarot. All of these were um, associations made to the tarot that whether or not they are valid in terms of like, oh yeah, this is where the tarot comes from. The, at this point, this is where the meanings of the tarot do come from in many respects. Well, thank you. That's super interesting. And it brings to mind, um, I remember at one point looking into Jewish meditation and um, learning that like Abraham and the burning bush, he was sitting in meditation. And so then now thinking of maybe Joseph uh, reading Pharaoh's dreams, but that's really like a tarot divination. Like it's right. very cool. Um, yeah. If you have like further books on the relationship of the two that I could start with, um, I definitely. Okay. I, I've shown in one, um, there's Israel, Regardi, R-E-G-A-R-D-I-E. He has a book called Garden of Pomegranates. And I think he also has a book called The Tree of Life. Um, so if he, I think, is good and understandable, some of them are not understandable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of attention towards making things sound very mystical and spiritual. <laughs> that doesn't really, you know, there, there's a lot of attention also towards like, oh, you know, only if you're this can you, can you ascend here, all that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, I remember, a friend of mine once saying about like the Kabbalah, yeah, you know, there's no mysticism in Judaism. So that's what they made up. But, you know, I, the Kabbalah would be like a more mystical aspect of Judaism. But, but people often mention like Joseph uh, uh, interpreting the dreams of the Pharaoh. So that's again, the kind of thing that um, like when they say the Jews were the priests of the Egyptians, the Jews taught that kind of thing. Um, again, one really doesn't know. There was certainly, it was not, I don't think it was always like a slave master relationship with the Jews and the Egyptians. I think that there was more, um, a more symbiotic relationship at a certain point, but yeah. Yeah, really. I can't get into, but yes, it's really fascinating. I don't know what new books there are out there. I'm not really familiar with that, but the, but the, but I'll also take a look and I'll see what else I have. You can then start to get into, there's all these books from like the turn of the century and Alistair Crowley's book will say some of it. What's the, it's the book of Thoth, the book that's associated with his deck. Um, and th I find that, I find that really interesting to read in terms of the meanings of the cards too. Especially the meanings of the, um, his take on the meanings of the court cards are especially interesting and really relate them to their, you know, elemental place and their place on the tree too. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? All right. Let's, let me see if I can do, where's the sharing? I want to share my screen. Let's see. I guess this. All right, so let's start with the wands. Is this being shared now, the, the, the cards? 
We can only see the, the finder. Choice, okay, let's see. New share. Um, I'll do this, yeah. Okay, yep. um, now you can see it, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, there are four suits and they each represent, um, uh, you know, uh, fire, the four elements in the Western um, spiritual or uh, occult or esoteric iconography. And um, they are, wands are fire, those that would be like the most subtle. Next would be water, which are cups. The next would be air, which are so, which is swords, and then earth, which is pentacles, coins, discs. Like they are called a lot of different things. So, talking about the meanings again, the meanings can become very personal. And um, so, I started with my two decks because, of course, my two decks are intentionally reflective of my understanding of the meanings of the cards. I would say, in terms of your in terms of building your understanding, you know, sometimes you could just separate out the, the, the court cards yourself. You can also pick cards for different people, just yourself, uh, or, you know, think of a person and then from the court cards, pick a card that would reflect that person. Um, think about the different, as always with the meaning of the minor arcana, think about what words are associated with the element of fire. And you can also think about the astrological sign, which for fire would be Aries, Leo, and um, Sagittarius. Uh, and th think about the, um, so the kinds of words like fiery, someone who has a fiery nature, or smoldering, or um, uh, burning, or bright also. Um, uh, there's the notion of, of light and heat and warmth and um, conflagration. These are all ideas that come up with the notion of fire. And these are all people who, uh, who in some way embody the element of fire as a person. So each of the, each of the, the, each of the suits, each of the, the king, I, in this deck I have king, queen, prince, princess. Uh, in uh, Rider Waite, it's king, queen, knight, page and only the queen is feminine. Most more recent decks add two feminine. They have the like, or, you know, father, mother, uh, brother, sister, or son, daughter. These are ways that they, uh, they all can show up. Or girl, boy, that kind of thing. Um, the king is associated, all the kings are associated with the element of fire. All of the queens are associated with the element of water. All of the princes are associated with the element of air and all the princesses are associated with the element of wands. You will see disagreement about the meaning of, of each of these cards and about um, the, uh, well, the meaning about each of the cards themselves and about, you know, say, like I was, I was, I looked at one book of my books today that uh, associated the princesses with, what did they associate with? Um, something like, uh, I can't remember what it was, but whatever it was, it wasn't what, um, um, it wasn't what I, what I would have said the princesses were associated with. Um, uh, I'll find out. Um, but uh, this person associates each of the energies of the, the court cards with elements of mastery. Um, and so it would be, um, the uh, the wands would be more spiritual, more energetic. They're ideas, but but thinking is um, sword. So it's not a, it's not like a developed. It's not like a mental uh, a mental construct idea. It's more like that flash of intuition or of of inspiration. All of these would be the wands. And again, um, the, sort of the spiritual, intuitive, visionary, ener energetic, all the things that you think of fire, the way that fire is also lights up the darkness, the way that like prior to electricity, fire was the source of light and heat and food and all the things that we need. 
Um, so the king is fire of fire. So the, that, that, that would make the king, generally speaking, a, um, uh, a you know, the, the, the two, like, like, so for example, in astrology, if you combine, like there are certain elements that fit well with each other. So obviously fire and fire would fit well with it. So, so he would be a, 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 a person comfortable with himself. Um, but if you go, if you, if you lean too much on the sort of fire of fire and water of fire, I think that that's, that's not, so, I don't, I have not found that to be the most helpful way to look at them. So the kinds of things that I experienced about the, that my experience about the King of Wands reflected in the imagery that I've chosen is a leader. Like also even in readings that I've done lately, like when the King of Wands show up, it often has to do, it can has to have to do with like leadership of yourself. Like teaching is kind of a king of wands thing, but any po politicians, political leaders, people who um, uh, speak out, who are somehow like at the podium, um, and that person could be full of hot air or they can be, um, you know, genuinely inspiring. And uh, a, um, but again, fire of fire that is like a leading energy um, and igniting and, um, uh, and powerful energy as well. If it's reversed, there would be more of a tendency to be something of a blowhard or to have like a, uh, you know, somebody who, well, let's just say like Trump, for example. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, somebody like sort of full of themselves or that sort of narcissistic quality or wanting to be like in front of other people just for the sake of being in front of other people. Could think of like Leo for that, you know, the way that Leos like to be classically in front of other people. But, um, you know, and that can be a great thing. You can have like really charismatic uh, leaders with a lot of Leo. And it can be like, just, I need to be seen. I always need to be looked at. So um, the queen of wands is a water of fire. So water of fire doesn't really sound that inspiring, right? Because water puts out fire. Although water and fire also create steam, which is, um, and boiling water, which is necessary for food and, um, and, and, and can provide a certain sort of energy as well. But if you think of queens as the emotional element of the, of the sign, um, queens are like the m emotional element of fire. So think of things that like, like the home fires burning or hearth and home. These are the kinds of things associated with the queen of wands. And so I always think of the queen of wands as being, th there's a certain, there's a domestic and a professional aspect to the queen of wands. I, I don't, the queen of wands is not so much a homebody, I would say, as somebody, although it can be somebody who, but it is definitely somebody who is comfortable and happy in their home. But there's a certain sort of like fire energy there as well. So often these days in particular, it's somebody who also works and is satisfied and happy with their work. That's the queen of wands upright. It's about that. I usually find that this is a queen who has the balance of work and home really emotionally centered. Like the ideas, the driving force in their life has an emotional uh, validity, but also retains a certain outward energy, the kind of outward energy that you associate with fire. Um, and what? What signs are we talking about now with the queen? So any of the fire signs, I mean, one would think about the fire signs generally, which would again be uh, Aries, Leo, and Sagittarius. It does not mean that when the fire cards come up that you are always talking about somebody who is an Aries, a Leo, or a Sagittarius, but it does indicate the kinds of qualities that you think of as associated with those signs. Um, so then, uh, the Prince of Wands, the princes are always in my experience about activity and action. They're think of like, again, young men, they don't really want to sit still all that much. I'm not talking about boy, I'm talking about like, um, 
you know, that sort of, that, that night energy that like, I'm going to be the one that, uh, not, this is not the ruler, that's the king, but the warrior, the one who's going to, uh, uh, the one who has that kind of strength and um, daring and uh, drive to just go. So air and fire are combustible. This is a combustible energy. <laughs> And um, so, so here, so I have like, you know, a runner. So it, it is the, the difficulty with the Prince of Wands can be, um, if it's like reversed, it can be, if it's reversed, it can mean not having that kind of oomph or drive or get up and go or like um, uh, the, the just, the, the, that just sort of like, I'm gonna go there and do that and go on the quest and nothing's gonna stop me and nothing does stop that person. There can also be the question of burnout and, uh, or of, um, you know, like uh, burning up quickly, like, and then um, dying down. But for the most part, the Prince of Wands is um, uh, energetic and visionary also, because again, the wands are, uh, they tend to be visionary. So all of the, so all of the cards have the certain aspect of looking for a spiritual, visionary, um, uh, uh, energetic quality, that they're driven by the sense, the feeling, not, not the emotion and not the idea, but the, the um, but something that is beyond idea and beyond emotion but is just a, an, a, a, an igniting force, spiritual spirit. <laughs> um, and then the princess is, um, the princess is earth of fire. So again, earth and fire are not generally considered compatible. Um, but if you think of the princess as like the youngest energy of the, of the suit, that's what I find. And I, I often find the princess have a certain sort of naive, or again, earth is about manifesting. So it's about manifesting that energy in a particular kind of way. I find that the princess of wands is a lot about communication. Now communication is, is more specifically an air quality, but this is, I often find the princess of wands, the kind of thing of like not being afraid to ask the stupid question. The Princess of Wands is often like like the, the little kid in the Emperor's New Clothes who says, you know, but he's not wearing anything. Um, and also when the Princess of Wands comes up, it's often about not being afraid to ask the question that comes up in your mind. There's a kind of like naivete and honesty about, I think all of the princes really, uh, princesses um, upright. And reversed, it's often about like either suppressing or not listening to that that feeling. So there's also that same kind of like spiritual integrity and um, igniting quality to the princess of wands um, that, uh, that, uh, that, that leads to, it can also be about going out and looking like sometimes the princess of wands comes up when like, you know, it's not going to come to you, you have to you have to look and see what else is out there. You have to explore. You have to be willing to take, uh, to take the step. So let's see. I'm going to So just to give you a sense, here are some other of the um, court cards. These are other of the wands in some other decks. Let's see. I'm gonna do so you can see them both together. Let me see. So this is the Rider Weight. So the Rider Weight, I, I love the Rider Weight deck. That's the first deck that I saw pictures of in a book that I then asked my mom, told her that I wanted a deck of tarot cards. And she didn't get me the Rider Rider Weight deck. But I mean, you know, they're sort of like medieval and romantic and, you know, they're lovely. And then this is Crowley's, which, like I said, is also very important, especially in terms of 
you know, like what he wrote about the meanings and the way that he really thought of like fire or fire, water or fire. Uh, he kind of gives the Queen of Wands a little bit of a, um, he doesn't like her so much, but you can see he also has like these cats associated with it. So she has like a jaguar, jaguar, he's got a lion, uh, and this looks like a tiger there. So that sort of like powerful fire energy. Um, and then this is another deck that I liked a lot uh, years ago. It's called Tarot of the Spirit. And it's very much also related to these two decks. Um, so here we have the, the king, the mother, and again, here's, here's, there's a lion. And this is very similar to the strength card often. Um, the brother who, and, the, um, and the sister. Um, any questions? Okay, let's see what else. I, I have a question. Yeah. Um, when these big cards, like to me, they're like big cards. And the big cards, come, these come, cards come up. How do you interpret them? Like. When the big cards come up? Yeah, like if you pull a king of wands. Mm -hmm. uh, is it the person or the situation? Well, that, that's a good question. And that is like really difficult to know. And I also took pictures of this deck because I knew that, well, Audrey with us was using the wild unknown. And then th these are just two outlier decks that are like, you know, different. This is that like elemental tarot, which is very alchemical. Um, but just to show you more versions of the cards. Um, so when, um, Oh, these are all different versions of the King of Wands, for example, just to sort of give you, again, a sense um, of uh, how the, like, just to see sort of one character in different decks. But it's, so whether you, this could tell you something about the King of Wands generally, and, but also it's like within the context of the deck itself that you get more of a sense of what, how the different cards are different from each other. So if you, if you just pull a card, Sheila, if you ask a question and just pull a card, that's more difficult than if the card shows up in a reading. If you ask a question like, um, uh, what should I do about X, you know, and the, say the King of Wands comes up, it's, pro it's either, then, then it's a little bit less clear, but the only way you could work with that is I mean, either someone you either you need to go to someone like that. You need to get a teacher, or there's somebody like that who's going to come into your life. But you need to think about that energy and incorporate that energy either from yourself or from someone else into your approach. You need to either be that person, or you need to find that person to help you. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Yes, I, I pulled it for myself as part of our process. Uh -huh. you pulled and I had no idea what to do with it. Like, I was like, okay, I'm in quarantine. I don't feel especially powerful. <laughs> so, um, so the, and, and it came up for you in terms of asking, like, sort of what should I do? No, um, it just came up in terms of, like, because I'm pulling a card each day. Oh, right, right. Uh, so, pulling a card each day. So, so I actually I pulled it twice. Even I pulled it once for myself, and then I pulled it reading, doing a, a reading, a free reading for someone else. So that can be, it can be about teaching, which if you're doing a reading for someone else, then that's a kind of, I mean, that's not typically what you think of as the king of wands. It can be about like, uh, it could be about having a, again, it's fire of fire, about having a certain kind of positive attitude and a positive energy. And I am, yeah, I am teaching a lot. Yeah, so it's about, it's often about teaching it. Often, okay. so the King of Wands is like, I often think of the King of Wands as a speaker. So if you find yourself, even though wands are not about communication, it's not a speaker in the sense of like a talker. It's, it's somebody with something energetic to transmit. Okay, that, that makes much more sense. And it's about being that person 
in a proud, secure, leadership kind of way. Not for your own sense of self, but because of the value of what it is that comes through you. You are the fire. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Melissa, I just have a question because my cards, um, I have an old deck and so I don't have a prince or a princess. I have the, the page, the knight, the queen and the king. And right. so you said that the page is a princess and the knight is more yeah. like the prince. Yeah, I, I have it backwards here. I, actually, I didn't see. I mean, I was taking a lot of pictures at once. And so, um, yes, the page, the page should be on the other side. The knight should be, the page is the princess. And if I were you, I would just tend to see the page as a, I mean, I would give it a, I would see what comes up for you. I would not tell you what to do. But, mm -hmm. um, but you might want to experiment with the idea of the page as having a more feminine quality, along with being young. Okay, so basically the, the night is the air energy and the page is the earth energy? That's right. Okay, so I mixed it up. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, I, I have I have them in the wrong place right there. Okay, any other questions? Does that seem pretty? You guys have a good sense of what the the wands. So now we'll move on to cups. The cups are water, so they represent emotion, and I would say that the cups are probably uh, easier to make sense of than most um i'm sorry melissa i have another question about the okay wands. i'm so sorry it's all right <laughs> um the ten of wands mm -hmm. you know the guy oppression oh, right it's come up a bunch in uh readings that i'm giving to people for fun um and i wonder is it i never because i'm a fire sign I never think <laughs> fire of, as a bad thing, but right. the t Ten of Wands is certainly a negative card. No? Well, the Ten of Wands doesn't have to be viewed as a negative card. None of them have to be. Um, so as I, as I said, when we were talking about the ace through 10 of each suit, wands in particular, that sort of fire energy, you know, like think of it like when you're inspired, it's that initial burst of inspiration that's most exciting. And then it works up to a certain kind of peak like it would be the six. And then you kind of have to keep going. You have to kind of find it within yourself to keep going. That would be the seven. And then the eight is like maybe something from outside of you is going to um, like spark it up a little bit more. And then the nine is like, okay, you know, I'm gonna have to look for some help here. It's getting to be a lot, but you know, I, I'm managing it. And the 10 is like, oh my God, when is this gonna be done? So, you know, I don't know how I'm going to bring this to form I, because wands, that, that fire energy doesn't like to be brought to form. It likes to just burn, you know, it likes to just, um, so, so that's what the 10 of wands is. Now the 10 of wands upright can be like the, the good news is it can be like the last push that you have to do. You could think of him as carrying that last bundle of sticks and having put all the sticks in one big, huge bundle to take it so we wouldn't have to do it anymore. <laughs> Reverse, it can be not so much of a burden, or it can be like, it's not so much of a burden, but you're not going to get to put it, to put it down anytime soon. <laughs> um, but, but upright, yeah, it's a burden, but it will be put down. It's being carried now, but it will be put, but, but you will put it down and it will be done. So it's not endless suffering. No, no. And even when it's reversed, when you may not be able to put it down anytime soon, it's usually not as heavy a burden then, but it's just like, it's just not all there is to it. Or it could be that, the, that you're about to put it down. Reversed, you kind of have to see what else is around to know what it's really saying. But it's not endless suffering. Not at all. None of the, um, all of the minor arcana cards are, um, are situations. So they are inherently not endless. They are inherently just a situation. 
And even the major arcana cards, which are about more states of mind, again, as states of being, like states of being go through changes too. None of it is permanent. Thank you. I remember you saying that once in a video and it was so helpful. <laughs> okay, so the, um, the, the cups. Um, and, uh, so the king of cups is um, a little uncomfortable with his emotions. <laughs> That's why he has like, there's a vague sense of, you know, he's the fire of, of water, not entirely comfortable with, but trying to be. So, so that's why there he is with his drink. That's like an easy thing to do when you're uncomfortable with your emotions. <laughs> and, you know, you can be that like really, you know, uh, cheery, outgoing, big personality, but it can be, you know, but it's, it's not necessarily bad. That makes it sound bad, but we're all a little uncomfortable with our emotions sometimes. And we all have to find like ways to deal with it and ways to be in the world, you know, when we are feeling things that are um, not, that, that we have to find a way to incorporate into um, being in the world in a way that where the emotions can't just be all out there. Um, so uh, the queen of cups is water of water and is like the most intuitive emotional card. This is like the, um, the ideal woman, you know, blonde haired, blue eyed, of course, which I don't think fits any of us. Um, although maybe I'm not just looking at all of you, so I don't know. Um, but you know, it's a very intuitive, lovely card when it comes up, whether it's about yourself or about someone else, it's somebody who's very keyed in, very tuned in to their emotions, to the emotions of others, to their creativity, but there can be a certain passivity about the Queen of Cups, not necessarily, it can be creative, but there's more of a tendency to just feel the flow. The Prince of Cups is more the artist, that's, he's definitely the romantic one. So um, not always like, you know, in the big picture, you want more than romance and more than just a nice song. But, um, but he's definitely like the, uh, uh, the troubadour of the, of the tarot. And the princess of cups is again, we're talking about with the princess, we're there's that sort of like um, beginning earth, the beginning manifesting energy. So again, the, 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 he's air of water. So air again, being a kind of expression, the kind of, that's why he then becomes um, uh, singing or sound or, uh, uh, the expression of, of emotion, which is why he's like then the artist. Um, the Princess of Cups can be too. I find when the Princess of Cups comes up, it's a lot about like waiting for the cup to fill. So there's a lovely energy there too. And again, it's again, earth of, of water. So think of like a beautiful pond, you know, or um, a clear lake or, so there's a, a beautiful reflective energy um, it's there's a kind of there's often a sort of waiting tendency or an internal tendency there too or or a, um, the, the the feeling of it being important to wait to not act too quick to wait till the cup is full and when the princess of cup comes up reversed often the person is like impatient with the process of waiting and is having a hard time like letting the cup fill before um, drinking, taking action before offering it to someone else. Any questions? And so here, let's see, here's the, this is the, here's the um, Rider Waite and the, um, the Crowley and the uh, uh, Tarot of the Spirit. So you can see the kind of um, watery blues here. Blue is also used for air, but it's a different blue. He uses a, like a deep, per she, or she, this was Lady Frida Harris who actually painted these cards. Um, and there's a deep purpley blue here. And here there's that kind of turquoisey blue and green. And then my outlier deck. I think it's interesting in this deck that the king is an animal for all of them. 
And the queen is almost always naked or nearly naked. And the lady is dressed, the lady in the night. So that's interesting. And in the tarot of the spirit, it's all, it, it's animals that, uh, you know, that I don't know. Yeah. I'm not sure why she picked a snake for fire, but okay, any questions? Okay. Is this, uh, I can't see all of you. Let me go to the um, screen. So how is this, how is this, uh, uh, how is this? Are you, are you getting a good sense of the cards from this, of the meaning of the cards? Okay. Um, we're getting, we, yes, Heidi. Question. Why is there a fish in that cup? A fish in which cup? The, the, um, this one? Just a Princess second. Page. In, in the page. Let's see. Uh, oh, that's right. In the wider, wider weight, there's a fish. Um, let's, uh, let me get the screen sharing up. Is that like the reflection you're talking about, maybe? Uh, I would say that it is more, again, because the pages have a certain aspect of manifestation. You're talking about right there, the fish, right? The fish with the page of cups in this card? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it has to do with, again, the potential for manifestation that comes out of the page, because it's, again, earth. And that's what I was saying with like the notion of just waiting for the cup to fill. And the, they have the manifestation. It, 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 Pamela Coleman Smith drew the images under Arthur Waite's guidance or whatever. But the, um, the, the fish would represent the potential for manifestation. There is also like a psychic intuitive aspect to, um, to water, to all the water. So all of them have like the, the aspect of, of a psychic intuitive quality. With the king, there's the potential for um, translating that into the world of work and business and all that. Um, but also there can be a certain sort of like discomfort. How am I going to use this? The queen of cups is of course totally comfortable with, the, um, with that psychic intuitive quality, but doesn't feel a need to do anything with it. There's more of a drive to do something with it here. And then in hers, there can be the king can get a little lost in it too, but it uh, doesn't have to get lost in it either. The prince, there's the, the, um, the, there's more like the offering to another in the aspect of the psychic or intuitive and the connection to others in the, in like sound or art or whatever. And with the princess, again, that the, the, the psychic or intuitive can also be listening to the messages of the, of the psychic or intuitive. So there's almost like that hearing quality, like he's like listening to the fish or the fish is speaking to him or something like that. So there's that as well. So there's a story, there's a folk story about like the, uh, of somebody looking for a mirror that was supposed to tell them about themselves and um, looking all over and then eventually finding it. And it's just this beautiful, clear pool of water. And the, but the, so there's that also, the notion of being able to see or hear or learn something with the Princess of Cups through this clear, uh, the looking, looking at the, clear water or listening to the fish who's coming out of the water to tell you. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, uh, rather than, um, uh, rather, so it's, it's, uh, there's only two more minutes, so it doesn't make sense probably, we probably will start with the, um, start with the, um, swords and and the coins um next time but let's also but prior to ending let's just oh so here's the uh so the queens are all water of water so i picked the fire of fire 
So now I'm showing you the queens, which are all represented of the water element. Here's, here's the selection of the queens from all those, all those decks. So you can see a certain sort of, a certain kind of, you know, feel or consistency to them. So um, what do you guys think? How do you, uh, how is, um, how, how, what, what thoughts do you have about the court cards so far, far about them? Maybe in this next week, you can try selecting out the court cards on a couple of days a week and just pick one for yourself that day. That again can be a good way to start to learn them. Um, to play with, just, just see which court card comes up for you and see what you identify with in yourself of it. Because sometimes the card that will come up will be like perhaps um, telling you about an aspect of yourself that you don't think about so much. Hmm. Any thoughts? I think sometimes the court cards are the hardest to become comfortable with using with, you know, because it's can be a little confusing. But that's why it's all the more important to also just let them speak to you too. All right. Any any questions, comments, thoughts? I I have one question, Melissa. <clears throat> okay. When you're reading for someone else, are you ever asking them their question? Am I ever asking them their question? Oh, do you mean, do I ask them what their question is yeah. prior to doing the reading? Yeah. Um, I don't usually ask them prior to doing the reading. Sometimes when the cards come up, mm -hmm. if I'm like, what were you asking about? Yeah. Like sometimes that will happen. It'll be like, I'm not really sure what you're asking about here. And that can, sometimes I will we'll say that like if I'm really not sure or if I'm, it looks like they're asking about something, but I kind of like, that's not what I would have thought they would be asking. Or, you know, like if I'm sort of checking if what it's showing, if I'm reading it correctly, if I'm getting it correctly. Just for your clarification. For my clarification, yeah. But I think it's fine to ask the person that you're reading for, especially, I think it's good to see what the cards look like first and get your own sense of it. And it's totally fine to ask them what they were asking about. Okay, thank you. Okay. And Melissa, do you let other people pull your own cards when you do reading for them or you, do you pull the cards yourself? For them? I let them, if, if it's with somebody that I'm with, obviously, because a lot of my readings are remote anyhow, mm -hmm. I do read phones, right. obviously then, but even then I let them control it. I tell them that I'm running my hands over the cards and they'll tell me when to stop. Mm, okay. But otherwise I let them pull the card. Nice, okay. If they're, if they continue to get like weird card after weird card after weird card, then sometimes I'll step in and go, okay, here, I'm going to pull one for you. What does this person really need to be getting from this? What's, what's the message supposed to, what should I tell them to like, you know, uh, stop that cycle to, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so we'll continue with the court cards next time. And again, um, email me any questions that you have. And we'll end with one final ohm. Oh. All right, thank you so much. And I will post this class. I think I didn't, I, will, I haven't posted the classes from last week. I'll post those as well, should you want to review. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.